lovely little presentation for us today. Hopefully you'll have something to drink along um, at the same time. Um, and then there will be the opportunity for the Q&A at the end. So without further ado, Sarah Knowles, MW, um, welcome and cheers. Thank you, Anna. Um, welcome, everybody. It's amazing to see so many members on Zoom suddenly seeing into my spare bedroom. Um, very surreal, but I hope you're all well, and I hope you've all got something in your glass. I, of course, have a glass of Zinfandel, uh, and I'm hoping that we'll all be able to, to raise one to Joel towards the end. So if you don't have one now, feel free to potter off at some point, as long as, you're on, as, long as your speaker's on loud, so you can continue to hear Joel. But uh, help yourself to a glass, maybe some nibbles. This is a new format of tastings for us, but it should allow you to have um, all the comforts of your own home. Um, Joel has been working with the Wine Society uh, for more than 30 years. It's one of our longest term supplier relationships uh, from California, and it's an absolute pleasure. He is known um, as, as the godfather of Zin for a lot of very good reasons, and I, he's going to go through his history with Californian winemaking for us in a moment, so I'm not going to jump the gun. But over the years, we've worked with him with Ravenswood, and we've launched his new project, Watson Future, in the UK market. And he's also made countless numbers of exhibition wines for us uh, over the years, which I'm sure you will have enjoyed um, as I did. Um, usually, Joel and I meet in much more relaxed circumstances. I tend to go out each year, and Joel tends to come to London quite frequently, and we usually meet and chat over dinner, and Joel always tells the best stories, which is why I thought it would be a fantastic winemaker to start with. So I really hope you sort of sit back and relax, have a glass of wine, and enjoy hearing all about Joel's history in the wine trade, but also about Zinfandel and all the projects he's worked on. Joel, thank you so much for coming, and I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. It was such a long trip across the pond. I mean, really. <clears throat> so. <laughs> Sarah thought it would be interesting if I uh, gave you a, a little clip of my life and how I got to be a winemaker uh, before we actually taste some wines and review some of the wines. Um, so I put together, uh, I suppose, what could be considered a family album, if you will. So bear with me while I put this up on the screen. And um, <clears throat> there we are. Sarah, are we on the screen? Perfect. Perfect. Looks good to okay. me. Well, as you probably all know, uh, I uh, started Once in Future um, in recent years, in 2014, after spending a long uh, time at Ravenswood, uh, in fact, starting Ravenswood and building it into uh, what it is or what it was. And, um, and so I thought we would start to kind of show how essentially one bottle of wine uh, changed the fortunes of an entire family. Oops. Well, let's see. Are we going to be able to make this work? Ah, there we go. So that is um, my great, great grandfather. And he was the one that started this family in California. He was a whaler who gave up whaling and started a dairy farm in Petaluma of all things. And he arrived in California in 1852, which was the same year that Zinfandel arrived in California. Coincidence? Yeah, I think not. Um, I had pretty exceptional parents. Uh, they were both chemists. They met at a chemical honor society meeting and the chemistry was good. And I guess that was the result. Um, my mother was quite remarkable. She was a nuclear chemist. Uh, that worked on the atomic bomb at Oak Ridge. And um, she uh, was pretty appalled by what happened at Hiroshima. Uh, so when I was born, she decided to you know, give up chemistry for a while and stay home with me, which was great for me, but it was pretty tough for her uh, because she had a very active mind and she had to do something to keep herself from going crazy. So she learned to cook because she thought cooking was like chemistry and she applied all that chemistry to cooking. Uh, but she also read amazing cookbooks and one of them was a cookbook by Elizabeth David, uh, who I believe was a Brit expat in Southern France. Um, and Elizabeth David said the French drank wine with their meals. 
My mother had never had a bottle of wine. I wasn't, she wasn't a drinker. They drank lots of uh, gin, I'm sure. Uh, but, but she'd grown up on a farm um, in Marin County. Uh, so she said, being my mother, I'm going to go find a bottle of French wine because that's what I read about. So she ended up going to the city of Paris in San Francisco where they had a French wine cellar, probably one of the few places where they sold wine and asked for a bottle of wine that would go with turkey for Thanksgiving. And the guy gave her a bottle of Chateau Neuf de Pop from 1945. If he'd given her 43 or 42 or 46, I probably wouldn't be here today because those vintages sucked. But 45, as you all know, was a great vintage. And that completely turned my parents into wine drinkers. Um, my father found a place in Southern California um, <clears throat> uh, that was called Lords and Elwood, where he could actually order wine. It was kind of the wine society of its day, so to speak. Um, and that's the first catalog they've got. That's a catalog from 1952. Um, and if you look really closely, maybe you can't see it, but there are things like Chateau Aubryon for $6.35. Uh, you know, that sort of pricing you know, makes us all very envious today, to say the least. But what it meant was that they had access to really amazing wines at reasonable prices. You know, that was still a fair amount of money to spend on a bottle of wine. Uh, even when I released my first Zinfandel in uh, 1979 and charged $7.50 for it, people were outraged that I should charge so much. But Bordeaux was selling for like 14 by that time. Um, so it was a, it was an interesting time. It was a great time to be building a cellar if you were sort of upper middle class as we were uh, and build a cellar they did and get interested in wine they did. Uh, my father, you know, judged at various fairs. He went to various wine um, events. Uh, you may recognize, the, well, the, the man in the very middle is my father. Uh, but you may recognize the man to his left. That would be Harry Waugh. Um, and I'm not sure who the rest of those people are. There may be some people who know that. I know that Richard Peterson is one of them. No relation. Uh, but there are... Um, uh, but you can see that wine became so. Oh, by the way, notice the ties. I love the ties. I also love the length of the cuffs. Style is everything. <laughs> but we always had wine on the table. And um, so I grew up in a household that was about food and wine. And it was very much about, um, you know, good food and good wine. And my mother literally made a study of it. Uh, and she became friends with Alice Waters. Alice Waters was the person who started Chez Panisse, uh, which was the essence of California cuisine. And when Alice uh, did her first cookbook, my mother did all the recipe testing for her to make sure that they all worked uh, for people at home, because obviously what happens in a restaurant and what happens at home are pretty remarkably different. But it was an era of, oh my God, you know, lots of really great wine, lots of food, you know, and parties. I mean, just people every week would have a party or two. Um, but my father actually uh, had, a, had his own wine club, uh, and he wrote a wine newsletter, and every Friday he'd sit around with, you know, uh, 15 or 20 bottles of wine, and this group of guys that got together. And at some point he started sharing that with me when I was about 10. Uh, so I learned to taste wine very early. I mean, technically, I mean, basically it was shut up and spit uh, and just, you know, smell and, and appreciate it. So I got, to I got to taste a lot of those wines. I didn't go on to become a wine merchant. <laughs> I, um, I went on, I ended up living in Berkeley in the gourmet ghetto um, in the early 70s after, you know, rolling around Europe for a year um, and um, took a job um, <clears throat> uh, stimulating lymphocytes and growing tumor cells. I was doing medical research at the time and was beginning to work on an advanced degree. Um, and then, and by the way, I was also spending a huge amount of time 
uh, drinking other people's wines. I was uh, considered to be a good wine taster. And whenever anybody opened an old bottle or was having dinner, I'd get an invite and a call because I, I probably had some of them before, but I learned a lot more about wine then. Um, I love that poster just because uh, it sort of became me. I talk, I laugh, I play, I sing. No, I don't. <laughs> Please don't sing, Joel. <laughs> uh, oh, but I was at a happy asking, Joel. <laughs> I, I was at a happy tasting you. not singing and um, ran into that guy in the middle of that picture, a guy named Joseph Swan, um, ex-former airline pilot, uh, starting a winery, but it turns out that he had uh, been enamored with grapes for many, many years. Um, a woman told a story about Joe Swan at his memorial service about him moving to Minneapolis, and she knew somebody was strange moving into Minneapolis when the guy dug up his lawn and planted grapevines in the front of the lawn, and then requ requisitioned her bomb shelter for a wine cellar. Um, Joe Swan was best friends with Andrei Chelichev, who was considered to be like the dean of California winemaking at the time. That's Andre there in the white shirt. Um, <clears throat> and so essentially, I spent all my weekends and all my vacations from 1972 until 1976 uh, with Joe Swan uh, at his house. I had my own room. and. Uh, I really learned the nuts and bolts of winemaking. I kept you know, my hand in research until 1977 and then left and took a job running a clinical laboratory at uh, Sonoma Valley Hospital so I could be nearer the wine uh, process. But listening to Andre talk about wine, listening to Joe talk about wine, um, really uh, enamored me. Joe Swan uh, made Zinfandel but it was only an accident that he made Zinfandel. He, had, uh, he really wanted to make Pinot Noir. He was in Forestville, which is kind of in the golden triangle of Pinot Noir in the Russian River Valley. Um, and he wanted to make Chardonnay, uh, but he was going to practice. And he practiced making Zinfandel like he was going to make his Pinot Noir. And Zinfandel was not thought of highly as a grape at that particular juncture. It, you know, it, was, it was kind of the old, quote, Italian variety, even though it wasn't Italian. Um, and it, um, it had been made into bulk wines, it had been made into sweet wines, the white Zinfandel craze were just beginning, but you know, he just wanted to practice. So he, he took these old grape, this old mixed black vineyard, which was mostly Zinfandel, and fermented it in a small open top fermenter and made it just like he was going to make his Burgundian style wine. And lo and behold, it was magic. Because 1968 is still fabulous today. Um, I got there in 72, so I got to be part of his process of making these grapes from the Teldesky Ranch uh, by that time um, for the next four or five years. So I was bathed in Zinfandel, literally. Um, and Andre said to me, he said, well, what are you going to do? I mean, what, you, know, you want to start a winery? Um, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I said, you know, everybody wants to make Cabernet and I grew up drinking Bordeaux. And he said, yeah, he said, maybe so. He said, but you should really think about what California's grape is, even though he was a proponent of Cabernet, he was pushing me towards the traditional grape of California. Um, and so I um, thought I should learn more about that. Uh, <clears throat> in the process of learning more about that, I ended up getting all the really glamorous jobs at the winery, um, you know, washing things down. You can see I was eating and drinking a little bit too well during that time. Um, but we made everything in small open top redwood fermenters, much like that. Um, and I um, began to learn about Zinfandel. Literally, I almost took a Zinfandel odyssey. Um, we had no idea where Zinfandel came from uh, at that time. Uh, there was a wine writer that wrote that he thought it came from Mars, uh, but it had, it was certainly prolific in California. Um, so a guy named Charles Sullivan did a lot of research on this, sort of as a dare. We spent a lot of time at the table at Joe Swan's. Charles was a friend of Joe's as well, um, talking about this. And he actually determined that 
Uh, the first Zinfandel arrived in the United States between 1824 and 1829, and it was sent to Colonel George Gibbs in that hotbed of grape growing in America, Queens, Long Island, New York. We're talking like right across from Manhattan. Uh, I've actually been to that location. There's still a park there. Um, uh, and it was shipped to him from the Schoenberg collection. He traded a group of, a collection of rocks that he had for cuttings, for horticultural cuttings. Uh, Gibbs, in 1832, shares these uh, cuttings with George Prince, who was an amphilographer, uh, who actually named the grape Zinfandel. You know, who knows why? Um, it was, it was uh, Gibbs described it as a rough black German grape. Yeah, obviously they had no idea where it came from either. Um, but it came to California in 1852, uh, same time as my ancestors, with a guy named Frederick McCondry. Um, and it was planted a year later by Joseph Osborne in Southern Napa Valley, um, near where Trefethen is now. And then it spread over to, um, uh, Valle to Vallejo's place in Sonoma, on, in part because Osborne uh, wasn't disliked by his employees, and so they just shot him back in early California. It was tough being an employer. Um, and uh, Vallejo's winemaker was a Frenchman, uh, a guy named Foire. And I can, you can imagine Foire getting this grape to work with. He probably said something like, Mon Dieu, Claret, this is like French wine. It's got acid. It's fantastic. Um, and because what California was working with at that time was a mission grape, which was a pretty you know, poor grape for making wine. Um, but Zinfandel had found its niche in the world. It spread through California by 1888. It was the most planted grape in California. Um, and today it is the third most planted grape in California after Cabernet and Chardonnay. Uh, so it's still a really, really important grape in California, uh, and it's grown in all regions, uh, in part because it's like a chameleon. It adapts to that region, and it takes the character of the terroir of that region like almost no other grape. And it has the flexibility uh, to grow in a wide range of climatic conditions and give you different flavors, but all those flavors are good. In part, it doesn't have any of the green, because it doesn't have any of the greenness of Cabernet. Um, it starts out with, you know, strawberry flavors and just moves into blackberries and really dark plummy characters. So it's got a capacity to adjust to climate and soil in ways that most grapes do not. So the quest was not really over at that point. We still, we'd gotten, um, we've gotten Zinfandel from the Schoenberg, you know, somewhere in Austria, uh, to, uh, to California, but we had no idea where it came from. Uh, there was a lot of uh, the proposition that it was uh, Primitivo, uh, but uh, we knew that Primitivo had been planted later and uh, I had planted in the vineyard side by side with Zinfandel and it just didn't look the same. It is clonally uh, a, a variation of Zinfandel, uh, but the vines are a, a bit more diminutive. It shatters easily. Uh, it's got some significant differences from uh, Zinfandel in terms of its cultural uh, look. Um, so it's, I got a call from, and, and meanwhile, Carol uh, Meredith is working on DNA, and she's determined that um, uh, Zinfandel and Primitivo have the same DNA, uh, but there's another grape uh, called Plavats Mali that is very similar. And so Mike Gurdjieff thinks this may be uh, Plavats, uh, but um, Plavats may be Zinfandel, but uh, Carol proves that it's only the son of Zinfandel. So she goes on a, uh, an excursion with uh, Eddie, Eddie Malatik and Ivan Ivan Page, Page, excuse me, uh, and looking for Zinfandel. So for years they kind of scourged through the vineyards of Croatia 
and they find this grape ultimately that's called tributary uh, that is a genetic, genetically identical to Zinfandel. So David Gates and I, uh, far uh, left end of that photograph, um, are uh, go to present California Zinfandels and learn about the history of tributary. And it turns out that this grape is a very old grape. Um, it, the first documented um, uh, recording of this grape is 1488. So it was planted you know, before Columbus discovered America, you know, like, or at least it was being grown before Columbus discovered America. Um, and apparently was the, uh, uh, the, the favored wine of Marat the pirate, who was a Barbary pirate, who was actually a Scotsman. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and it um, was grown by Venetian nobility. Uh, there was a whole set of castles along uh, the Dalmatian coast. Uh, that area was owned by Venice at the time. Uh, and it was a way they kept the Saracens from entering Venice. Uh, and they grew tributary as their main wine. I like to say, if you went to a costume ball in Venice and in 1300, you probably were and drinking, and you were drinking red wine. It's a good chance you were drinking Zinfandel. Um, so uh, you can see it's called uh, by multiple names. Uh, Zerlenat Kastelansky was the name it was given, but that was kind of a general name. Tributary was the name they uh, settled on because of the historical stuff. There is. Uh, uh, a grape called Crotosia uh, in that same general part of the world. In Zinfandel in Italy has multiple names, Moroloni, Primitivos, Zagarese. Um, and it got to, got to um, New York in the 1880s and was called Zinfindal. And then uh, it made its way to California. And today, far and away, the most gro grown Zinfandel uh, in the world is grown in uh, California. There's about 20,000 acres of it. Yeah. So here I am. I started a winery in 1976. Um, doesn't have a name at that time. Um, I don't have any money. You know, I don't really have any wine skills except what I learned from Joe Swan. Uh, I don't have a winery uh, and I don't have any grapes. You know, got all the credentials for starting a winery for sure. Um, uh, but, you know, I go out and I find Old Vine Zinfandel, really, uh, there's a, little, there were a few mixed blacks in it, and I make wine, uh, and the wine is pretty darn good. There is a problem, however. I don't have enough money to bottle the wine. Uh, fortunately, uh, I meet this guy named Reed Foster, who is a Harvard Business School graduate, another wine tasting. Yeah, okay good connections at wine tastings. Uh, and uh, Reed says, oh, I've always wanted to be part of a winery. You know? So it was a perfect match. You know? So he put together a limited partnership. We raised $100,000, which I thought was a boatload of money at the time. That lasted about uh, six months. Uh, but we got the wine bottle and we got it out there uh, and uh, we grew. Um, and along the, with the growth, um, I decided it was okay to have a kid. And that is my kid. I put him to work immediately at the winery. Uh, that's Morgan Twain Peterson. And as you can see, I gave him all the really good jobs, hoping, him, hoping to turn him into a physicist or something interesting. Um, unfortunately, well, actually really fortunately, he decided that he liked the wine business and would go into the wine business. He used to ride my back when we were going through vineyards and taste grapes. I could always tell when the grapes were ripe, ripe because he'd spit out the ones that were underripe if I gave it to him. And he's grown into a young man and we go play in the vineyards together. Um, we indulge ourselves in eating and drinking, which is fantastic. But the worst part is now I have to listen to him because he got his MW in 2017. So now I have to consider what he says to be pretty much true. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, so the winery struggled on, you know, like I had 
friends in the, you know, that were wine drinkers and we, we, you know, we sold a lot of wine direct and um, really, you know, every winery needs a break. And um, my break came in really 1988. Uh, so I had been making wine for almost 10 years and Robert Parker showed up at the winery and he wrote this amazing glowing review and gave the wines very high scores. Um, yeah, so you just kind of go, all right. And suddenly there were people lining up at my door. We were on serious allocation. Uh, when we would release our single vineyard designated wines, people would, there'd be a line of 30 or 40 people outside the door the morning of the release to buy the wines. And for the next week, it would just be chaos until they were essentially sold out. Um, pretty amazing. One small write-up. Um, but, you know, I didn't think Zinfandel was getting its due, did, nor did a number of other people. Uh, so we started an organization called ZAP, Zinfandel Advocates and Producers. And so people like Kent Rosenblum and Jerry Seps and others joined this organization. And we had uh, our first tasting. We managed to get 50 people to come to that first tasting, less, no, less people that are on this, uh, this call. Well, these days, uh, it's a, the largest one day tasting of a single variety in the world. We tend to have somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000 people that come to it, depending on you know, where we are and what we're trying to do. Uh, so obviously the grape has grown um, in popularity. Uh, it also allowed me to really hang out with some of my favorite people. Uh, we formed a little cadre called the three R's of Zinfandel. So Paul Draper there on the right, Ridge, Kent Rosenblum in the middle, Rosenblum, and of course myself on the left. And boy, did we have fun. Eating and drinking with those guys was about as good as it gets. Um, Paul is like a professor. He will teach you everything. Uh, Kent loves to tell Sven and Oli jokes. And I have my own uh, <laughs> genre of things that I do too. So it's fantastic. Um, but, you know, when you're a success and people want your wine and you like to make wine, you end up making more wine. And ultimately I grew Ravenswood into um, a very large winery. Um, and, and we had at one point 20,000 barrels uh, that uh, stood on racks like that. Uh, it was quite the process. Uh, of course, you don't do those things yourself. You know, Gary sitting there on the left is, was uh, one of my winemakers and uh, he is now the head winemaker at Coppola. Peter Mathis was the genius, really, the mechanical genius who kept the winery operational and, uh, and running. Uh, he's got his own winery called Mathis. It's always nice to have spin-offs from, you know, what you're doing at the end of the day. So, uh, but about that time, when we got to about 400,000 cases, we got acquired by Constellation. Um, and boy, did that change my life. You know, we learned a lot about marketing, you know, for sure. You know, this is just a small little petois of things that uh, they use to, to sell wine, including the tattoo, the woman on the upper left hand, that's a real tattoo, by the way. Uh, and uh, Ravenswood was the most tattooed logo uh, in the wine business. It was, it got to the point when I go to an event and somebody come up to me and say, I've got something I want to show you. That was code for, I'm taking my clothes off now. Yeah, because they always had tattoos that they wanted to show. Pretty remarkable. Well, yeah, obviously I had a lot of fun during those years. We did a lot of interesting stuff. Um, and I made a ton of that stuff. You know, uh, Ravenswood, Vintners Blend, Zinfandel uh, was sold worldwide, as were some of my other wines. Uh, at one point, Ravenswood sold one in every four bottles of Zinfandel sold in the world. Uh, and it was just because of that wine. Um, yeah, you know, lots of really good old vines went into that. I discovered Lodi, I discovered some of the other places in the world that had old vines. Uh, it allowed me to do really a survey of California to put together a blend that was interesting and good and consistent. 
Um, but it also allowed me uh, the luxury that I'd never had before, even though, even though I'd done a tour of Europe in 1970, I hadn't been back much uh, and I'd never really gone into European wine country. Uh, so finally I had enough money and, uh, and boys that were old enough uh, to do some um, traveling in Europe. So um, my uh, younger son's first real official tasting was at Domaine Hue, that's Galen, that's Morgan standing next to me. So we, we went to Hue among other things, but we, we traveled every great region of, um, of France to learn more about winemaking. Um, it was fascinating. When you go to a place, you suddenly, no matter how much you read about it, you suddenly realize, you know, that it's, you know, why it is the way it is. If you go to the Rhone Valley, you just kind of go, oh, now I get it. Now I know why Cote Roti and Hermitage and San Joseph are different and why they are what they are. Uh, you can read about it all you want, but it doesn't, it's not the same as being there. So that was great. So needless to say, I was flying high. <laughs> we, had a, we had a very interesting process going and it was great. Um, and ultimately I got uh, inducted into the Vintners Hall of Fame uh, for California uh, with a lot of other quite amazing people. For me, it was like, really? Uh, I'm in this crowd? Uh, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing, I have to say. But after 40 years of making wine for Ravenswood, um, you know, when you get to be, I was 68 and I had to decide really what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. You know, I figured I had 10, 15, maybe 20 if I was really lucky, good working years left in me. Did I really want to run a million case winery for the rest of my life? And the answer was, yeah. Not really. Um, it was really, you know, when you get to be as big as I was, you don't really make wine anymore. Yeah, you go out and clean out a tank now and again, you do some things like that, but you're really telling other people how to make wine uh, and you're overseeing a whole operation. Uh, wasn't what I loved to doing. I was good at it, but yeah, you know, but I was, I really in my heart wanted to do something else. So it was time really to go back and get my hands dirty. I uh, sort of do everything with this new winery. The rule of this new winery is that I can only make as much wine as I physically can make myself. I get a little help just because you can't do everything, but, uh, and I don't pick all the grapes myself, obviously, but I oversee all the vineyards that I work with. You know, I literally do most of the physical work uh, in the winery. Um, so it's really a one man project. So if you taste that je ne sais quoi in, um, in my wines, it's probably a little of my sweat. Yeah, as you can see, I dig these, you know, these fermenters out by hand. Uh, I am making wine just like I made it with Joe Swan, uh, really back to the early days of Ravenswood, you know, which was the time when I believe I made my best wines small open top fermenters, punched down by hand, native yeast fermentations, um, literally um, uh, only French oak, uh, usually at around the 30% level. Obviously there's a little variation depending on the wine I'm working with, but it's all um, one person making all the decisions and pretty much one person doing most of the work. And that winery now is called Once in Future. So, um, the um, Once in Future is um, really about focusing on individual vineyards uh, and the character of those vineyards. Um, Zinfandel is so unique in the world of grapes and is so uh, willing to mold itself to its place within the, uh, the possibilities of the grape, uh, that you can make very unique and very special Zinfandels um, from various uh, locations. So the first location we're going to look at is Oakley Road. Um, and Oakley Road um, is essentially a sand dune. 
you know, when uh, California was gold mining, they used something called placer mining, in which they used these high pressure hoses to blow hills apart to get to the gold. Uh, those, all that stuff ran into the Sacramento River uh, and was washed down in successive floods and created these sand dunes. Uh, and these sand dunes are due east of San Francisco, just behind um, Mount Diablo, which acts as a rain shadow, really. And so it probably gets maybe 12 inches of rain a year. So it's remarkable that these grapevines grow at all. Uh, but what's more remarkable about them is that they're all on their own roots. Uh, you can see there's no central stem that comes out of the ground. They just come out of the ground like hydra. Um, and uh, the grapes they produce are very special. They're very different than um, rootstock grown grapes. Uh, rootstock clearly changes the nature of the way the grapevine grows and different rootstock change the nature of that vine. Um, so uh, these, these wines tend to be softer, um, very perfumey, uh, they have fine tannin, uh, they're really delightful uh, to drink. Um, there's a cool, you, this would be a fairly warm region were it not from the cooling breeze that comes off of uh, Sassoon Bay uh, through the Golden Gate and off Sassoon Bay uh, in the late afternoon. So it keeps this area cold, the grapevines shut down. So even though it's warm here, um, the grapevines read it as being much cooler than it is. So you get these grapes that have very nice acidities, but are also you know, really quite lovely in terms of their balance and their character. Um, <clears throat> I thought just for the fun of it, um, I would, um, read Galoni's descriptions of these wines. Yeah, you know, because why believe me? You know, I can tell you that they're wonderful and they taste great, but if I can get a second party to tell you they're wonderful and taste great, it's even better. So um, I know that uh, the Wine Society has the 2018 Oakley Road uh, Zinfandel and Galoni says the 2018 Zinfandel Oakley Road Vineyard is laced with Gorgeous, floral, and savory notes that give the wine such a distinctive personality. Rose petal, sage, mint, and wildflowers are all beautifully lifted in this exquisite Zinfandel. I wouldn't be a bit surprised that the 2018 is even better with a bit more bottle age. Now, so that's not such a bad description of that wine. Um, it's one of my favorite uh, Zinfandels. Uh, to drink early, it will live for a very long time, uh, but it's such a, um, a good one. So next we have um, Sodini Zinfandel. Uh, it was a, this was a vineyard that um, was planted uh, in about 1900 in the Russian River Valley. Uh, it uh, has great vines that look like that. You know, and it's organically farmed. Uh, Morgan and I have been working on bringing it back uh, from its previous state that uh, produces like really beautiful um, plummy cherry-like uh, wines uh, because it's in that cross between uh, Russian River and Dry Creek um, structure, flavor. They're really, really lovely wines. Uh, Sarah's told me that I need to move a little faster so we can go to questions, so I'm moving a little faster. Uh, this year I started I making Oak Hill Ranch. Very subtle, John. I nah. was trying to be so subtle. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. just know that there are lots of questions coming in. So, uh, okay, so we, we want to make sure we have time. Okay, well, I'm, al I'm almost done. Um, so the mm -hmm. 2018 Old Hill Ranch is, um, is a new wine for me, except it's an old wine. I've been making Old Hill Ranch at Ravenswood since 1982. It's an amazing old vineyard planted in 1885, really mixed blacks. Uh, it's got a lot of Grenache in it. Uh, Galoni sells the 2018 Old Hill Ranch Zinfandel is flat out stunning, deep, layered, and super expressive. The 2018 offers unreal complexity, much of which comes from the diversity of the field blend of about 14 varieties that include good bits of Grenache, Mataro, Alicante, Carignan, among others, a wine of total understatement. The 2018 is not obvious, but it 
has so much going on for it. Readers who can take some, uh, some time with it. Old Hill is one of the most pedigreed sites in Sonoma Valley. Joel Peterson certainly got every bit of potential out of this fruit in 2018. What a wine. Yeah. Who, who wants to argue with Galoni on that one? <laughs> That's Will Buckland who farms the vineyard. It is organically farmed as well. Uh, beautiful red soils, um, uh, interesting, interesting farm and people. Um, and then of course there's Bedrock, uh, which is a vineyard that um, you know, Morgan and I um, uh, farm and own, organically farmed, uh, very old vines, obviously mossy, uh, uh, alluvial fan, dry farm, um, and you know, it sits right in the heart of Sonoma Valley. Um, and Galoni says, um, the 2018 Bedrock Vineyard is rich potential wine endowed with real breadth and intensity. The natural weight of this Sonoma Valley site comes through loud and clear. This is a decidedly big brawny Zinfandel that will appeal most to readers who like bold, larger scaled wines. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure I agree with all of that, but um, it certainly has the baking spice and uh, the structural characteristics that are associated uh, with this site. Uh, and then we go to Teldesky, uh, Dry Creek Benchland, you know, one of the uh, storied sites for growing Zinfandel in California. Uh, lots of really old, beautiful grapevines, another mixed vineyard. Um, and I got to hang out with the Teldesky family. I've been working with them since 1982. The first wine I tasted from uh, this vineyard um, was out of a jug. Uh, John's father, that's John Teldesky there, John's father made it um, when we had lunch together. And it came from a particular block, the oldest block on the ranch, 1904. And so the wine I make uh, from the Teldesky Ranch now is from Frank's block, which is the block that Frank made his home wine out of. And it's uh, significant amounts of, <coughs> of Alicante Boucher and, and uh, Carignan in the mix. Maloney says, and he gives it 96 points, which is a little scary. One of the highlights in, in this range, the 2018 Zinfandel Teldesky Vineyard Frank's Block is flat out stunning. In 2018, the Teldesky soars out of the glass with magnificent aromatic complexity and depth. Inky, dark fruit, lavender, spice, menthol, licorice, and plum infused the 2018 with tons of nuance and complexity. But it is the purity of the flavors that elevates the 2018 into the realm of the sublime. Dollops, dollops, get it, have you of co-fermented Alicante and Carignan uh, add striking nuance. This is a stellar showing. So there you go. Um, and the best part of all, of all of now is that I get to work with this exciting young group of people and old people. Uh, it's, it's a, um, California right now is going through lots of changes, you know, not all caused by the COVID, uh, but uh, lots of changes, uh, and there's a changing of the guard. The young are taking over. Uh, the old guys are still around, and there's a lot of sharing, and there's a lot of fun going on. That guy with the glasses on there over there to the far left is Phil Katuri. He's our, um, he's our hippie wine consultant, vineyardist, uh, who um, does all the high-end Cabernets on the mountains because he's the only one crazy enough to put grapes in, these, in solid rock. Will Buckland is on the tractor with me. Uh, that's Chris Cottrell, on the, the laughy one on the left, uh, who is Morgan's partner, that's Morgan, and uh, Jake Neustadt, who is the young, youngest of us, but he is the most knowledgeable when it comes to grapevines of anybody I've ever known. So I am doing exactly what I love to do. I feel incredibly fortunate to be able to do it. And it is my good fortune and my good luck to have people like you who drink wine and with any luck will love my wines. So there you go, Sarah. I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Joel. That photo is fantastic. I think that really captures so much of the spirit of, uh, of what you're doing at the moment and the cross generations, but also being able to work alongside your son looks fantastic. 
I was also dreaming of some of the more uh, open vista shots, given my current view of many train lines in London. But uh, <laughs> but I'm glad to, glad to see it. Um, mm. I think uh, Anna and Emma are now going to control some of the questions that we've got coming in. So I will hand over to them. Okay, so we've got quite a few questions that have come in. Um, the first one was from Keith Cooper. If you can unmute yourself, Keith. Hello, Anna. Oh, it's Emma, isn't it? Can you hear me, Emma? <laughs> we can, thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, Joel, um, it's been fascinating listening to that. Um, I, don't, I didn't know much about um, Once and Future Wines before I heard this tonight. Um, I have tasted them before at the Wine Society tastings. Uh, so it's been really interesting to actually hear from you and hear what you've had to say. Um, my question is regarding where you actually make the wine. Uh, do you, I'm not sure that you have your own winery. So do you share facilities uh, with someone else, maybe your son up at Bedrock? Or if not, where else do you actually make the wine? Um, no, I actually, you know, I obviously had the good fortune to help be the banker for my son's winery. So he's obligated to give me a corner of his winery. Uh, and... It's kind of amusing because he's got pretty much a state-of-the-art um, winery uh, that um, um, that really makes great wine. Uh, but if you go down his state-of-the-art winery, you get to this little corner where my you know redwood fermenters are and my hand punch down device are. It looks like it's a history lesson in winemaking. <laughs> but yes, I make them at his winery. Thank you. And I use his like his crusher and his equipment. So yeah. yes. Thank you. Yep. Fantastic. So the next question comes from Alan there. I apologize if I said your, your surname wrong. Alan, are you there? No. no. Oh. oh, there we are. There we are. Am I on? I'm on. You are. Um, Joel, uh, a sort of more general question, really. Um, and you may disagree with what I'm saying in a way with this question, but do you think the absence of a clearly defined Zinfandel typicity undermines its reputation as a serious grape variety? I have to, I have to say, um, on my side, I think Zinfandel is my favourite grape. I mean, I absolutely <laughs> love it. It's my desert island wine. But I just worry about its reputation generally. Well, there is no doubt that uh, it comes from a place where it has been beaten up pretty good. Um, before Prohibition, uh, Zinfandel was California's most important grape, and it was made into a very claret-style uh, red wine, and there really wasn't a lot of variation except out in the Central Valley, where in 1850, they were, no, in 1880, they were making white Zinfandel, but only because they were putting so many grapes on the vines, they couldn't get them to color up. Um, the, um, the wine after Prohibition survived, the grapes survived in part uh, because it was such a flexible grape. And they could make fortified wines out of it and sweet wines out of it and jug wines out of it. So yeah, it, the typicity was, um, was difficult. But with the advent of the 19, you know, 60s, late 60s, early 70s, with the advent of Ridge and Joe Swan, ultimately Ravenswood, um, the style of Zinfandel really tightened up. Uh, and it became a wine that was um, more Chateauneuf de Pop esque, if you will, you know, slightly higher in alcohol, uh, meaning somewhere, most of the Zinfandels run between 13.9 and 15.2, uh, with the vast majority of them hitting the mid 14s. Um, and it's partly because of the nature of the grape. Um, and there are a lot of them that are made in. Uh, very sort of traditional, you know, claret Rhone style, if you will. Um, there has been a movement uh, among uh, the larger wineries uh, to sweeten things up because they've done a lot of uh, consumer surveys that say that people like, um, you know, sugar in their wine. So think Apothic Red, 15 grams of sugar in what is mostly Petit Syrah and Zinfandel. Uh, the Prisoner, another one, you know, very sweet. Um, uh, so, so there is that. So really the two major styles of Zinfandel now are the Claret style represented by myself and Ridge and, you know, Morgan's Wines at Bedrock and uh, the majority, in fact. And then the 
the, the whole group of heavier, heavier, uh, higher alcohol, higher sugar wines, mostly represented by large producers. Okay, excellent. So the next question is from Mike Bullet. Um, it's about vintages and drink dates. So Mike? Hi. <clears throat> Thank you, Joel. Very interesting. And um, I, I uh, d do well remember the dinner that you uh, attended last May in London, where we tasted quite a lot of your once and future wines. Um, and um, that was a most enjoyable evening. Um, the, I, I've got, uh, I, I'm just wondering about how long you reckon your wines will take to uh, mature. Um, I've actually got Th three examples of your 2017s, uh, the Sardini and Oakley Road and um, the Teldeshi. And I was just wondering how long you think that they're, they're likely to, uh, uh, you know, what, what would be the best time to, to let them run to before you start, start to break into them that much. Ah. I've got small quantities of each, unfortunately, but there we are. <laughs> um, we all make mistakes. That's, yeah, that <laughs> It's, it's, a, um, it's always a difficult question because different people like to um, uh, drink their wines you know, with different character associated uh, with those wines. I, uh, um, I was doing a, um, um, I was actually listening to a, a broadcast between my son and Galoni uh, when Morgan said, well, my pop likes his wines a bit older. And Galoni said, yeah, yeah, he comes from a generation that had the luxury of drinking old wines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my wines that I'm making now are very much like the wines that I made in the 1990s. In fact, some of the fermenters I'm using are exactly the same fermenters that I used then. Um, and those wines um, from vintages like 92 and 93 and 94 and 95 are beautiful wines right now for a guy who likes aged wines. They are, they are, they've softened up a bit. They've rounded up a bit. They have really interesting aromatics that you can only get by leaving in the bottle. But I doubt whether anybody, you know, you know, certainly my age <laughs> would want to leave wine in the bottle that long. Um, I have been drinking a number of the wines that I made um, in at the Ravenswood in the late Ravenswood era, uh, and those were made pretty seriously as well. The single vineyards were uh, between eight and ten years, and they are showing beautifully. So I think my wines will do the same. There are vineyards that drink earlier, I think, uh, and vineyards that drink later. So at least with the Ravenswood, and you will see this. I've just started making Dickerson Vineyard again. Dickerson Vineyard was always a, a um, a vineyard at Ravenswood that was very forward, whereas Old Hill, you know, it took forever to come around. Um, the Old Hill I'm making now uh, is probably a little more forward than the Old Hill I made in the 80s and 90s. On the other hand, I was getting a half ton an acre off the vineyard then, and now we're getting three tons an acre off the vineyard. So a very different um, growing situation uh, there. But yeah, it's a it's wide ranging. Those 2017s that you're drinking, um, I would give I would give them five more years before I really dug into them. But I'm delighted that you're opening them now, so you you understand them, you know them, uh, and you'll know what you like. Yeah, you know, ultimately. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I actually think there might be quite a few people with the 2017s at the moment because Gary and Roland asked about 2017s as well. So. Um, yeah, particularly well-selling vintage, I think. Um, so the next question is, um, it's a bit of an amalgamation because it covers the same thing. So it's from Dr. Howe and Bernard Stoneham. Um, is Bernard Stoneham here at all? Or Dr. Howe? Um, no? In, hello. Oh, Dr. Howe's here. Yes. I'm being very restrained, just sniffed so far. Um, and, and the question around is concerns the the top. Um, some some bottles have waxed tops, some have foil tops. 
but you cover your court with nothing. Um, could you could you tell us why? Yeah. Um, so uh, the foil um, obviously is a long-standing tradition, and in the early years it was lead. Uh, I still, you know, when I'm drinking older bottles, I still spend a lot of time scraping that lead off. And my understanding was traditionally it was put on um, wines to help uh, prevent cork borers from going into the cork. And I'm sure the lead you know, made them really dumb before they got to the cork. Um, but uh, that tradition uh, stopped in the early 90s uh, in California uh, because lead was banned. Uh, and so we went to um, tin uh, capsules, which uh, I don't know how many times you've lacerated yourself on a tin capsule, but I've done it a few times. Um, people began using wax. Wax is somewhat difficult to get off, uh, particularly if it's the wrong compounding of wax. Um, there are lots of variations on that but at this point, it's mostly decorative. Uh, it has no, it serves no functional purpose uh, unless you're putting some kind of an impermeable seal on it, and then you might as well put your wines in a screw cap. Uh, so where does all that tin and lead, no longer lead, but the tin and other stuff that goes around the capsule go? Goes in the landfill. Um, so at the end of the day, um, it's my feeling that you don't necessarily need the decoration uh, and why create more garbage in the world? Uh, so that's my particular stance. Um, and, um, and besides that, you can see the beauty of the cork. So do you prefer cork to screw cap? I do prefer cork, cork to screw caps, yeah. Um, you know, Screw caps, I mean, obviously it's controversial and lots of people are doing screw caps. And if you're making a white wine that you expect to be consumed in a relatively short time and it's all about, you know, modern white wine where there are all these high tone fruit characters and, and, and stuff that you want to preserve, yeah, a screw cap is probably exactly the way you should go. But if you're making red wines like I'm making red wines, wines that, um, mature and mature in part because of the very small amounts of uh, transpiration uh, through that cork over, over time. Yeah, it's variable. Yeah, it's got various problems, but you don't get the magic you get in old Bordeaux's. Uh, you certainly wouldn't get it if you put a screw cap on it. Uh, I just opened a bottle of 99 uh, Angelou the other night with this most beautiful cork in it that I've ever seen. I was very jealous. Uh, but the wine was also very, very nice. So, yeah, I think cork is the best closure that we have um, uh, ever come across. The fact that it was discovered early was remarkable. Is, is there a TCA issue with it? Perhaps, yes, that is true. But, um, uh, you know, I've lived with the risk for, you know, since I was 10. <laughs> you hit a corky bottle every now and again. It's a Excellent. tragedy. But, um uh, but you know, it doesn't happen that often, fortunately, anymore. Fantastic. So Richard Lane was coming with a question. Is Richard here at all? No, he was asking how you manage the high alcohol levels in um, Zen. Do you remove the alcohol after the wine has been made or do you pick earlier? I pick earlier. <clears throat> there are really two ways to achieve alcohol. Uh, in, well, actually there are three ways to achieve uh, alcohol below 15% in Zinfandel. Uh, one of them is to pick earlier, as I do, um, and ferment your wine, uh, and it will ferment to that sort of mid-14 to 15 point uh, naturally. Uh, and I think that gives you the best result uh, because you get the most completeness of the wine and you haven't fiddled with it in any particular way. Uh, one of the other ways that became popular of making high uh, Zinfandel was to, uh, and it goes along with the trend in California to try to pick grapes riper and riper because people like ripe flavors. The Prisoner is a classic uh, case in point. So you get the grapes very, very ripe. Uh, and then, uh, and they dehydrate. So you've got these super ripe dehydrated grapes. 
uh, that you couldn't possibly ferment to dryness. They would give you, you know, upward to 20 to 24% alcohol if you could. Uh, and then you dilute them back with water. Uh, but really what you're doing is you're, while you're rehydrating the grapes, and you're getting these really great phenolics that are really pre-oxidized phenolics, so you take away the life of the wine, but it keeps it soft. But you're also taking away the, some of the other essences that are in the wine that keep a wine vibrant and interesting and alive. But they're good for a few years. They're big and sappy and like, you know, intense. And then of course, the other way to do it is to um, use reverse osmosis or some one of the other alcohol removing uh, techniques uh, to do that. But I've actually, interestingly enough, I've never done that on any of my wines, even at Ravenswood, when I had the possibility of using uh, that kind of technology. Uh, it is, uh, it's much more valuable for me uh, to make wines that are alive and vibrant. Just wine used to, you know, school me all the time when I pull out a wine and say, this is a dead wine, you know, and uh, we really had two kinds of wines, alive wines and dead wines. And so I'm trying to make wines that are alive and vibrant. Excellent. Um, a few people have been asking about the difficulty of positioning Zinfandel in the premium category, which is possibly, you'd say there is no, there's no difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, people are enamored with um, traditional uh, categories. Uh, so uh, in California, uh, we were enamored with Bordeaux and Burgundy. Um, and, and maybe, you know, uh, the Loire Valley, um, we made a lot of Cabernet and Burgundy. And in part, it was actually even stated at the time Davis began pushing these in the 1960s, these grape varieties in the 1960s, that because the wines that sold for the most money were Bordeaux and Burgundy, um, they were the grapes you should plant because ultimately they would bring more money uh, in for California. So we got stuck really with categories um, that um, were sort of traditional categories that brought in lots of money. Uh, and Zinfandel is really California's version, if you will, of Burgundy or Bordeaux. It's the grape variety that was chosen for the region by the people of that region and that actually makes the best, most interesting wine in the region. And, and like other regional wines, uh, it probably hasn't achieved the same um, uh, price status as some of the others. But honestly, I think it's every bit as fine wine as anything else that is out there. You can put it on the table with you know, great Rhone wines or great, you know, even great uh, Bordeaux. I had a Zinfandel and a Bordeaux tasting. Uh, several years ago that actually, you know, came in second in the tasting against some very heavy duty Bordeaux. So it's a high quality wine and we position it that way. Um, you know, essentially in the U.S. wine, Zinfandel is, I mean, considering that I sold my first bottle of Zinfandel, that was the highest quality Zinfandel for $7 and 50 cents and upper end Zinfandels are now getting between 50 and $85 if you happen to be uh, Turley. We're doing okay. We're moving into that category. Fantastic. Um, so the next question was, um, how does your style and approach compare to that of Reg? And that how was does, a question from Mark Hudson. How does my approach compare to Ridge's? Yeah, uh, is Mark here? Yes, I am. Um, Excellent. You might have already answered it by classifying yourself with Ridge in terms of making Claret style wines, but I wondered if there were any differences that you aimed for. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Um, I'm a great fan of Paul Draper. I've known him for years. He actually, when I was a, a very young man, uh, he came to my parents' house you know, and was part of the tastings that my father put on. Uh, he's, I think, 84, 85 now. Um, and, um, and he 
yeah, was a great advocate also of single vineyard designates, uh, in, in part because he found out that Geyserville and Lytton Springs, which were two of his main wines uh, that were originally had been labeled Zinfandel, when he went out and did a vine count, they weren't Zinfandel at all. Um, and so he, just, he moved to really, uh, which he understood, he moved to the European tradition of naming the vineyard or naming the place, naming the terroir, which was exactly the right thing to do. Um, so Paul and I make wine in a similar way. Um, he uses indigenous yeast. We both pick a little bit earlier uh, than a lot of other people. Uh, but the big divergence, uh, I think, between our wines is um, the fact that I use French oak and he uses American oak. Uh, and American oak uh, is, has a profoundly different effect on the wine. Some people really like it. Some people like that sort of high tone vanilla, uh, which sometimes burn, verges on banana chips uh, and sauerkraut. But Paul uses, Paul's as good at, with it as anybody. Uh, but the oak tends to be a little more expressive. It tends to influence the character of the aromatic a little bit more, and it certainly changes the, um, uh, the end. French oak tends to work more uh, on the center of the wine, kind of supporting the center of it and add sort of a more ethereal perfume. So you get much more of the grape location and less effect from the oak. Um, there are obviously wines made in California that rely very heavily on American oak. Um, some of the wines from Lodi, for instance. Uh, but, uh, but Paul is obviously a man uh, who loves balance and he does a great job with it. But I would say that those are the major differences. Fantastic. Excellent, thank you. Um, so is Charles Earnshaw still with us? Yes. Thanks. Excellent, you had a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, that was fantastic, thank you. And, um, I've been enjoying a glass, um, actually not of a Zinfandel, but of your Mataro from um, Oakley Road uh, in 2016, which is really fantastic. So, um, fantastic. Yeah, so I guess like a lot of us, um, Zinfandel is, is my um, favourite grape, and I think it seems to do really well in field blends, um, from what I've tasted from Ridge, Carlisle, Bedrock, places like yourself. Why do you think that is? And do you think, has there any evidence of that being a tradition that's come across from Europe and Croatia, or is that unique to California? Um, well, obviously as a tradition that has come across, but if you go back to the writings of Charles Wetmore in California, in the 1880s, he did a whole survey of California and what grapes were available and Zinfandel. It turned out uh, you know, that not all spots are perfect for Zinfandel. Sometimes they overproduce, sometimes they, um, or they're too hot or sometimes they're too cold. Um, and Wetmore's contention was uh, that you could build yourself an insurance policy uh, by planting other grapes with Zinfandel that would support Zinfandel. Uh, so field blends are really that insurance policy. And it's part of what will make uh, Zinfandel uh, more flexible as climate change uh, continues to exert itself. Um, but if you look at these field blends, um, there seems to be a pattern. Um, if you are in an area like Rushmore Valley, uh, the vineyards tend to have more uh, uh, Alicante Boucher in them, uh, because while acidity is maintained, color is not, and Alicante adds color. If you go to someplace like Dry Creek, uh, which is, you know, warmer, uh, the vineyards tend to have more Carignan in them, because they tend to lose acidity, uh, and the Carignan adds acidity. The other thing about the field blends is that most of the grapes in those field blends ripen later than Zinfandel. Uh, and so if you were a person making, you know, Zinfandel in 1910, uh, and you didn't have all the modern conveniences we have or the thoughts we have about uh, alcohol, you had to find a way uh, to get those grapes to ferment you know, and finish fermenting because a stuck fermentation was really ugly. Um, and by including grapes that were um, ripe, but not really ripe, 
um, with Zinfandel, which would be really ripe, you ended up getting this really interesting combination of brightness and um, complexity uh, that for what field blends give you. Yeah. So Thanks field so blends, yeah, I'm all for it. We're planting, we're planting some new uh, Zinfandel vineyards uh, and they're all field blends. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Joel. I think, Emma, I'm going to have to jump in. Hopefully I'm not muted. Um, but <laughs> that was a fantastic masterclass, Joel. Um, clearly the godfather of Zin is not, a, not an unwarranted title. Um, I also love the idea that I've always had a similar taste to a pirate. I like the idea that Zinfandel was a pirate's drink. Um, I should have said from the very beginning, and apologies to those that I didn't and I may have missed, but all of these wines that we talked about tonight, the 2018s, are available from today on the Wine Society's website. Today is our release day for these. So, uh, so if you were um, enamored by some of the descriptions that we heard, please go to the website sooner rather than later, as Joel's wines still do sell out. There is the metaphorical queue around the block. Um, I also um, wanted to mention, if you've enjoyed this tasting, the events team are putting together a really comprehensive calendar of different Zoom events for the next few weeks or however long this may last. Um, and Mac Forbes is up next on ASNAC Day this Saturday. So look out for that and the calendar will go live on our website very soon. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, thanks again, Joel, for this, especially for being our guinea pig. We really needed a pro for our first one and you absolutely proved that. Um, I had a lovely evening listening to the stories, some of which I'd never heard before and really enjoyed. Um, I'm mainly just jealous of one of the members who has toasted this tasting with a 1995 bottle of Ravenswood. So uh, <laughs> to that member, you're winning. Um, you. And to the rest of us, we should put a few more bottles in our cellar. Thanks ever so much, Joel. Thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. And cheers from the Wine Society. Cheers to all of cheers. you. Cheers. Thank you so much. <laughs> I am very grateful that you're all here. Drinks in. That's all I have to say. Drinks in. Cheers. 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 Cheers.